Thank you, Lizzie. Um, I'm not very good at public speaking, but I want to say thank you all for coming today. Uh, this is really a nice turnout, and I'm excited. Some of you I know, some of you I've not met yet or until today. Um, I am the president of the Mobile Creole Cultural and Historical Preservation Society, and we have worked, and Lizzie has worked really hard. Thank you so very much for helping us with all of this to provide you an educational narrative on Mobile, its records, um, a Creole perspective, and the importance of preservation. And uh, so we will have three speakers this morning Ed, uh, Edward Harkins, aka Ned. And who is the archivist for the Municipal Archives here at Mobile, and uh, Dr. Chris Norman, who is our historian and information specialist, um, and also uh, author of Three Negroes of Mobile County, as his dissertation from the University of Alabama, and uh, he's also the book review editor for the National so uh, Society of Genealogical. Tell me again. National Geological Society Quarterly. There you go. Three times fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then afterwards, we will have Glenn Perry, who is our keynote speaker and the lead graphic designer for the United States Coast Guard here in Mobile, Alabama. And he, he and his daughter, Dakota Perry, are our videographers for our organization and our quarterly meetings that we have um, in January, April. Um, July and October throughout the year. So please come to those if they are all open to the public. And without further ado, we will get started with uh, Mr. Edward Harkins on Mobile Records. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be without a microphone, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me. I haven't used the microphone this morning. I'm walking around, so hopefully it's not distracting too much, but this is how I'm going to do things today. I did not have a slide presentation for you. Most of you are just talking, so hopefully you don't fall asleep this early in the morning. Also, since there's no copy for us this morning, that did not help. But I was walking around, I'll be talking. If you have any questions at any point, let me know. I'm going to talk about it. First, I'm going to talk about a little overview of the history of Mobile, talking about mostly timeline events. Then we're going to talk about what records are there around the city of Mobile and other places as well. And then my portion will be done. There'll be a little break and then we'll go on to the next speaker. I'm going to walk around talking to you. I'm going to watch everyone else a lot. We should have a fat table. And I'll make sure I end, up, end on time so that they don't distract me too much. Also, once in a while, I'll probably stop and take a little sip of water over here. I'm Ned Harkins of the Mobile Municipal Archives, which are Right down near the street at 457 Church Street. My institution has a record of the city of Mobile government. There are a few other odd men. So, first, I want to talk about a little bit about what happened around here in this area we call Mobile, Alabama. First, we got to start off with the Native Americans who came through thousands of years ago. We are finding things new about them all the time. As far as I know, None of the various travel groups that lived here thousands of years ago had any kind of language. There's no kind of written record, but we don't know a whole lot about them. All they have the artifacts and the structures they built. Has anybody here been to Bottle Creek? Fantastic site. If you've ever had a chance to go out there, you know it's out in the Delta. It's not the most accessible place to go to. It is restricted for people going there, but there are trips that are taken from time to time out there. If you have a chance, you ought to go, because this is fantastic. One well, probably the best sites in this area of the mound builders. Yes, ma'am. Bottle Creek. Bottle Creek. Bottle. Bottle Creek. Yes. So the Mobile Delta is not that accessible. But it's very interesting. Everybody been to Moundville, Alabama. It's very similar to Moundville because they have Structures built out of earth out there. But they have to be a very complex civilization to be able to do that. But we don't know a whole lot about it. I'm still aware that that takes a lot more than just finding the oldest human remains in the North Mobile County? No, I'm not. They did a report on it pretty bad. Got to look for that. Like I said, we're trying to do things new all the time. That's one 
most things about archaeology in this area, mobiles, we find new things all the time that are buried in the ground. Very exciting. Because Native Americans did live with like written language, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about them. Because history can be oral or it can be written. Oral history is fine, but you have to have somebody to continue the stories down the line and the stories have been interrupted. Because those trials moved away, those trials died off, the Europeans had no the respect for them, they didn't keep the traditions going. So we've lost that. In the 1690s, this expedition was organized. They came into the Gulf of Mexico. They knew exactly where they wanted to go. Because back that time, if you look at the maps, the Gulf Coast is further on the map. But 1690, there's a lot of maps that show the Gulf. Some are not very great, some are pretty inaccurate. But it had been showing up in maps in Europe for a long time by this point. So the French had an idea of where they wanted to go, and that was Pensacola Bay. That's where they were going, Iberville and his expedition, because it had the best harbor they built on the Gulf Coast. Europeans thought that was the best harbor you could find. Unfortunately, when they got there, the Spanish beat them by a year. The Spanish, the Spanish finally said, we don't like the French coming down here and try to claim this land that we believe was ours. So they had set up a fort in Pensacola, the French showed up. They were on friendly terms at this time, despite the various wars in Europe. Sometimes they were against somebody, sometimes they were with somebody. At this point in time, they were sword friendly. They said hello to one another, and the French kept going west. Came into Dolphin Island, found the bones called Massacre Island. Kept going west along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Missed the Mississippi River again, couldn't find it. So they came back, back there in Biloxi, and built Fort Maripal. Iberwell left his brothers there, went back to France to get the colonists. His brothers were supposed to explore the area and figure out where we set up our colony. Iberwell finally makes it back after a while. This is going to be frequent history for the French, because it takes a while, but they never come back to the Gulf. Because unfortunately for the French at this time, their king was King Louis XIV. King Louis XIV wanted glory. He wanted a colonial empire like the English had. That's just about the reason why he was coming on the Gulf Coast. He wanted a colonial empire in India. But he also wanted land in Europe. So every time he tried to land grab in Europe, a war would break out. And there was frequent wars. And everybody in Europe came up and beat up the French. And he never won a single war. But this time it was peace. So they went around, they made it back. The oldest brother died. Bienville was in charge. And he asked Bienville, okay, where do we need to go? And he said, let's go over here to this bay, go up the river to what we call the 27 mile bluff. Let's find the colony there. And they did. They called it Mobile because it was a local Indian tribe of Mobile Indians. So they sold the 27 mile bluff. That's where Mobile originated, up the river. 1701. Uriel left again. Go get supplies for colony. War broke out. Uriel ends up getting in charge of the expedition to take Charleston, South Carolina, and burn it for the French and Spanish, who were allies against the English at the time. He makes it back to Havana and he does a yellow paper. And he's buried in the back. That's our founder, Founder Mobile, Eberville. Not the Emble, Eberville was. So the colony started off on a poor footing. And like I said, this would plague the French throughout. They keep going to war, and then because the English controlled the seas, the English had a better fleet, the French couldn't get back here frequently. It took years at a time for them to finally make it back. Also, the King Louis wanted the colonies, but he didn't want to support the colonies. He never put a whole lot of effort into the colonies here along the Gulf Coast. Trade goods for the Native Americans were poor quality and lesser amounts of what the English people buy. So they were always having trouble trying to trade for the Native Americans around the area because the English kept beating them. Usually what happened to the Indians, they did get on their side as these Native Americans did not like the English, so they would take the French over the English. Not because so much the trade goods, because they didn't like the English were trying to spread out everywhere. There's so many of them, the French weren't. The less French around them were English, so they were more afraid of the English than they were of the French. So we all stayed there until 1711. 1711, there was a flood. We found out much about the Native Americans didn't stay in 27 Mile Bluff because of a flood. That wasn't good. So Bienville, who was in charge of the colony, looked around, trying to figure out where we're going to move. 
and they moved to where it is today, where the Mobile Delta meets the Mobile Bay. Now, one of the reasons why they picked Mobile was there was a fine harbor at the time off Dolphin Island. That would be destroyed later by a hurricane. But when the French first came here, it was a great harbor. About as good as Pensacola, but it wasn't sheltered. That's one of the reasons why they picked this area. So Mobile moves here in 1711 and has been here ever since. Well, the French had Mobile as the capital of Louisiana colony. They have the Canadian colony, Louisiana colony was everybody South of Canada. Mobile was the capital starting off until 1718. They finally found Mississippi, how to get to the Mississippi, how to get up the Mississippi, found a site for a colony there, and they went over there and started building a new colony, and we call it New Orleans. So 1718, they moved the capital out of Mobile to Fort Maripal, Malassi, and then eventually to New Orleans when they got built up enough to be the capital, and they took most of the records with them. Mobile became an Indian trainer post and a military outpost. Now, Mobile was important. Why we know they're important? Because if they came, the French came in the 1720s and said, you know what, we're going to build a brick fort there. The French, the French built less than a dozen brick forts across the entire North America. That's Canada and the United States today. They built less than 12 brick forts across the entire colonies they had. All the territory they had from the Gulf Coast all the way up to Canada, they built very few stone forts. In Mobile, we had one of them, Fort Condon. So this shows that we are still an important place. They still thought we were important enough to do that, because that's an expensive thing to do, to go out there and build a brick fort. It was easy, war, but it would, goes away real fast. They found out there is a fort. The 27 mile bluff, rotted. The first fort they built here in Mobile, rotted. So, that's, so they built stone, called Fort Condé. So that's how Mobile was with the French, pretty much. The population was low, they brought in two shiploads of women from France to try to settle down the Canadians that settled here. Original settlers were some French, mostly Canadians, mostly men. And they wanted them to stay here and stop running around messing with the Native American women. So they brought two shiploads of women in here to sell them down. A lot of the families that you trace back to come from those unions, those marriages. The Canadian men and French women. <coughs> so that stabilized Mobile. They had a population of 400, 300, 400. During most of the colonial period, that's the French, British, and Spanish. That's how we stabilized. Then, unfortunately, for the French, another war breaks out. In Europe, we call it the Seven Years' War. Here, we call it the French and Indian War. And the French lose. Badly. Sitting there in negotiations and trying to trade territory. Who took this? Who took that? Who wants this? Who wants that? Mobile ends up under control of the British. So the British come in in the 1760s, take all this territory from the Atlantic coast to Mississippi River, and they can split it into colonies, East Florida Colony, West Florida Colony. So there are actually 15 colonies in North America, not 13, there are 15 colonies in North America. People used to forget about the West Florida and East Florida colonies. And there's a reason why. And I'll tell you that in a minute. So the British came in, they set up the West Florida Colony, which Mobile was part of. The capital was Pensacola. The English came in, the natives that were here, many of them moved. Some went to New Orleans, some went to other parts where they had occupied previously, some left all together. And this is when the Creole families start showing up. Because these unions of the French, Native American, Canadians, Free men. The English came in and said, How are we going to address them? What are they? They're not us. They're not French. What are we going to do with them? That's where we get the beginnings of what we call Creole. So they had to come up with something to make them happy. Because these are important people all along the Gulf Coast. Nolan's, Mobile, Pensacola, whatever. And they had a treat of them. Especially because they needed their support to run everything. The British came in, the little didn't change a whole lot. There's still an Indian trading port, um, a Native American trading post, military post. 
Changed the course name to Fort Charlotte. It was the Queen of England at the time. Things didn't change a whole lot. Created the colony increase in size a whole lot. I think it was close to along, and then the eastern colonies started getting upset with England. By this time, Great Britain. Started getting upset with them. And it starts off the American Revolutionary War. This is where that difference comes in. Thirteen colonies on the east and seaboard all went to revolt. Two colonies down here on the Gulf Coast stayed loyal to the crown. They were loyal to the British king. They did not join the American Revolution. A lot of loyalists who fled those colonies came down here. So we stayed here loyal to the ground. We had some patriots come down here and try to rouse the crowds. You know what happened to them? They got arrested and thrown in jail because the population didn't care for it. So the American Revolutionary War breaks out. Things are pretty, actually pretty quiet, except for I said loyalists who came down here fleeing the colonies. Until Battle of Saratoga. Americans win this miracle Battle of Saratoga, and the French decide to officially come out and support the American colonists. They give them official recognition. Up to that point, the French have been clandestinely behind the scenes, giving them money, giving them weapons, giving them this, giving them that, because they hated the English. So they wanted trouble for them. But when the Americans won that battle, they said, hey, they have a chance. They might actually pull this off. And they officially came out on the side of the Americans. And went to war against the British. And when they went to go to war against the British, he went to Europe and said, Hey, join us. Let's beat the British up. Because we all hate the British. So they got the Dutch to join their side, and they got the Spain to join their side. But the Spain would not recognize the American colonists. Because they were afraid of what the American colonists were doing. They did not want a revolt to succeed in the colony. Because Spain still had huge colonies all across the world. And they did not want that example. They did not support that example. So Spain went to war against England, against the British, but did not recognize North American colonies. Yes, sir? That from the Treaty of Perfection in 1713, you said that, the, uh, that no treaty would be done about war or otherwise, and you can make it. No, it was politics. Well, they put a promise out and say, it is, it is, all politics was that Spain did not want an example of a successful revolt. That's why they didn't sign Treaty of Peace in Paris. Yes. So they, they did not want to recognize that. Because they feared that. But isn't that the same treaty that uh, continues actually in force to this day? Because, like, the Queen of England and the rest of European, all the European heads basically need their power or got their power through the, uh, uh, what they call it, the War of Succession, which led to the, uh, to the Treaty of Utrecht, right around 1713, 1714, which are also involved in their. Um, which said that the United States, or not the United States, no power, no power, even the war of Spain can make a treaty without the possession of both of them in order to force them out, which made the treaty of 1713 not the treaty of 1713. Now, let me tell you, politically, treaties are just words on paper. They do things based on what they politically want to do at the time. At the time, the 1780s, 1770s, 1780s, when the war was breaking out, the Spanish did not want an example of a successful colonial revolt. Okay, that's, that's politics. Now, they can use the words and use treaties to back up what they're doing, but they're looking at a political expedient. Because they still had vast colonies all around the world, they did not want those colonies to revolt against them. They didn't want to validate it. They didn't want to validate it. But, so Spain enters the war. Spain at this time had no owners. They got possession of it. And their governor over there, by the name of the man, Galvez, is a very energetic fellow who knew about the war before the British did along the Gulf Coast, put together an army, put together a navy, took the British out around Louisiana first, first like from the Natchez, and then came out from Mobile. Yes, sir. And, and is there a reason why Mobile doesn't mention that Galvez is general of the name Geronimo? Geronimo Geronimo and Geronimo is much clearer. Yeah, let's get a little more detail on what I'm trying to do right now. Okay. Let's get a little more detail on what I'm trying to do right now. So Galvez 
Knows about the war, takes the greatest shot around the Orleans first, then he comes out from Mobile. He attacks Fort Charlotte. This is one of the two American, American Revolutionary battles in the state of Alabama today. Attacks Fort Charlotte, blows the wall out, garrison surrenders. There was a rescue party from Pensacola that got there too late. They went back to Pensacola. Spanish take control of Mobile, and he starts putting together an expedition. He wants to take Pensacola next. The British know he's coming. Spanish set up a blockhouse over across the bay on the high ground, which is called Spanish Fort today. It's actually a blockhouse. It wasn't actually a full set of fort. It was a blockhouse. It's a smaller fortification. Had some troops over there to watch Pensacola. It's right at the end of an Indian trail that goes from Pensacola to Mobile. So the British sent an expedition from Pensacola to try to take the Spanish out. They hit Spanish Fort. Initially, they get the surprise. They're beating them up. Spanish rally and run them off. That's the second American Revolutionary battle in the state of Alabama today. That's the only two. Spanish won both of them. Where was that first one in the Fort Charlotte was not Fort County. Right down there, down there. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, they set up the siege line and the siege cannon and blew the wall out with some gears and gave up. So he went on, he took Pensacola, and we came Spanish. By the right of conquest. Spanish took over. 1780. Spanish came in, so that so their administration has some problems with the United States right off the bat, because who owns what? How far does our territory go? What do we actually get out of winning this war? Because we don't want to recognize the United States as being an official body. So there was a bunch of complications about where it is the border between us and them. Eventually, a man by the name of Ellicott was commissioned with a Spanish counterpart to figure out where is the line. As they came over, what line they're going to use, what line they're going to use, and they run it along, and that's where we got the Ellicott Stone, which is in North Mobile County, showing where is the separation of Spanish territory, United States territory, and Spanish Hill. They got ripped off because they thought their territory was a lot further north than it was, and it moved them back. Yes. It's in North Mobile County. Can you tell me approximately? You have to go up. You're there? Highway 45, isn't it? 43. 43, 43, 43 my bad. Highway 43 in the south side of one of the chemical plants up there. Uh, Alabama Power, probably about a mile south. Well, well it's a little further yeah. south of the Barrow Steam Plant. We'll see exactly as a big power line. Yeah, you'll see. If you go up Highway 43, you get off the interstate, go up Highway 43 and go north. You'll see a sign on the side of the road that says Alcott Stone. You have, to, you have to go down this path into the woods. And there, there it is right back there. How do you spell that name? Alcott? Alcott. E-L-I-C-O-T-T. Okay. Alcott Stone. Field trip for my truck is going to be the Well, this is very interesting. It is very interesting. It is one of the artifacts we have in the area that is very interesting. It, it has been worn. I mean, it has been put down for a long time ago. But it's still a very fascinating artifact to go out there and see. Now, I said there is a walking trail. If you go back there, you can see it. It is still in decent shape. Yes, sir. Oh, I was going to say, it actually serves as the uh, starting point of like, land. Like, like, you have your township and things you use today. Mm -hmm. And the reason why there was a dispute was about the treaty of 17, they split the territory in two, became part of the Alabama Territory, 1817, became Star State of Alabama, 1819. And the Americans came in. This is when the city of Mobile started growing as the Americans came in. 
They have a lot of energy, they have a lot of vision, they have a lot of ideas of what they want to do. That's when we really started to grow. During most of the colonial period, we had very little going on. Now, what about colonial records? Every single colonial power had mobile. When their time was up, they left with it. That's why there's very few colonial records, original records in the city of Mobile. Because when they lost, they took their stuff and left. And there's a lot of it in Orleans. Most of it is in Europe. In the National Archives of Spain, France, and England. Is there a bigger city, a more important city, you use it a capital, whatever was going on at the time? And they took a lot of records from Posen and Nolans, whether they didn't take it across the sea. So the Americans come in, and I am just about out of time here. So I said, the record period is a time of growth. I do have a handout here. We're listening. So, Americans come in, Americans open things up. During all the colonial periods, the government tried to control commerce. The government tried to control what was going on in society. Not as much as they were doing. It's one of the things they had to make control with, there was only one here most of the time, it was controlled by the government. Americans came in and said, to get back, they tore down Fort Cotton and built the first subdivision of Mobile, built with the first Fort Cotton is today, where Fort Cotton is today. They didn't care for Fort County, they didn't need Fort County, so they tore it down and built the first subdivision there. And we've been dealt ever since. Because Americans never really gave up this land until 1861 when they had a great town of the Confederacy. The United States was in control of most of the town. So records of state here on the Americans. This is a list of some of the local repositories here in this area that have records out there. I'll try to go through, try to think of places that are more organized. They have some general organization going on. They have some personnel taking care of them, they have some facilities taking care of them, they provide access, and they're going to have the best access in the world, but they provide some kind of access. You have Archdiocese of Mobile, where you can find their actual original colonial records of Mobile as an Archdiocese. They do have an archives. Not always the easiest place to work with, but they do have an archives, they do have records going back to the colonial period, involving the Catholic Church. You have probate court of Mobile County. They have colonial records because they have land records. They have those records. Every time somebody came in, they had to resolve who owns what. Who owns what land? Where are we going to start our land ownership? Under who? Who owns this, that, the other? If you go look at records today, they still mention Spanish names, French names, British names. This is such and such. The Verve Trap was part of this. No, you will see those names in land records today. So they have this other place to find actual original colonial records. And they are a fantastic organization. Um, judge Red Newton, when he was probate judge, came in, thought it was an important part of his job to have these records organized and accessible. And he created an archives department. They had a wonderful lady who, was in, who ran it for a very long time, Colette King, who put it in very good order. So if you're interested in land records, it's a great place to go to. It's down the street in the um, annex. We have the Mobile County Health Department, Bible records, one of marriage records, birth records, death records, Animal County Government, Health Department. Hopefully has them all. Hopefully you'll be able to find them all, but they are organized and they can get to them. The uh, historic Mobile Preservation Society, they started in 1935. They set up an archives in 1980, which is right next to Oakley. They run Oakley. They have an archives right next to Oakley. And it's a hodgepodge collection. They've got things that people have donated to them, people have given to them. They have a great photographic collection there called the Wilson Collection. Turn of the century, late 19th, early 20th century photographs. All kinds of architectural drawings. Have a, you go to the website and get an idea of what they have there. You have Historic History Museum in Mobile, an interesting institution. 
started in the 1950s under Caldwell Delaney. He had connections all across Mobile. He had families in Mobile. He was able to put that together, all kinds of stuff. Well, history, the history museum of Mobile is more than just artifacts, more than just walking in that room and seeing everything they have on display. They have a whole library, a whole bunch of material, all kinds of things in that place that he collected during his lifetime and has been collected since then. You know, the Mobile Public Library, all the history of genealogy. Been around for a very long time. Since the 60s, I believe. Is it? You know where it started in the 60s? One of the early records in the 70s was a gentleman who wrote a new book by the name of J.A. Bob. He went to the archives of Europe to write about his book on French Mobile. Mobile, the first Mobile in 1711. When he came back here, one of the things he did is had all the, much of those records microfilm. And those are available for the history of genealogy. If you want to look at colonial records and not originals, but copies of them, they got them here. That's another good place you want to go to the colonial history for the history of genealogy. They have a lot more than that. They've got all kinds of collections that's been given to them since then. So there's another great place to go to for just beyond colonial. They have a lot of things as well. We have Spring Hill Temple. Temple was started in the 1840s, one of the earliest Jewish organizations in the state of Alabama. They have their own archives. Another former director of local history genealogy, Bob Zeitz, when he retired from here, went over there and got the all really organized and going. So if you want to ever have any connection to Jewish history in Alabama, they're pretty much just Jewish history dealing with them. But it's a fantastic collection. Very well organized. It is open. You can't go in there. It's limited. Times are open. You can go in there and use your place if you have some reason you might have a connection there. The, oh, the name I just love. The Joy Lay McCall Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Used to be known as the University of South Alabama Archives. They're on the campus of the University of South Alabama. They're known for the photographs. They have the Ogilvy collection. Fantastic collection of photographs. Other sets of photographs. They have other records as well. They have courthouse records. Take the interest of genealogists. They have court records for 1918. They got them. They have records of various railroads in Mobile, in Mobile, Ohio, Mobile Gulf in Ohio, several railroad records. They have other things besides just photographs, more than just that. Now, they're restricted because restricted they're on South Alabama campus. You have to go get a parking decal before you can park to go inside the place. Don't forget that, or else you can get a parking ticket. Yes, I didn't know that. Thanks for that. I'm glad they did that. I think you want to get a parking ticket at the safety <laughs> office. <laughs> okay. But remember, you got to have that parking detail or you're looking up possible yeah. tickets for being on their, on their campus. But that's where they are. And they're more just than just the photographs. Photographs are tremendous. They're great. You look around town, you'll find businesses with the photographs up all over the place. But they're more than just that. The you know, Spring Hill. College archives and special collections. Now, this just deals with Spring Hill College. So, if anybody has anything to do with Spring Hill College, they have an archives. They have collections of students who attended Spring Hill College. So, if you have anything to do with Spring Hill College, there are good people to talk to. The you know, my place in Mobile is a archives. Most of the records I have in the with see given in Mobile from 1814 up to today. If they, you know, somebody might have done a petition, somebody might own a business, somebody might have worked fire department, police department. I might have something that my archives on them. Then you have the Mobile Medical Museum, over there on Spring Hill Avenue. They have records in the Mobile Medical Society. Then you have the Mobile Carnival Museum. They're putting together a research collection on Carnival Mobile, one of the research from Mardi Gras on Mobile. They're trying to put together, and they have a little uh, section on how you can do research on Mardi Gras Mobile. You yeah, have the Bishop State Community College. Now, these guys used to be more active. I was failed to contact anybody yesterday. I'm not sure what the status is today. 
Does anybody remember the name of Johnny Andrews? Love a genealogist, a little historian, when he passed away in the 90s, his collection ended up at Bishop State. They opened up this Black History Museum and Research Library based on Johnny Andrews' collection. It ran for a while, but the past few years they've been pretty silent, so I'm not sure what their status is right now. I don't know how accessible that collection is. Is that that little It's over Central Campus. That's where it was, that's where it is. On the back side of this paper, that's Alabama Museum, South Alabama, and Preservation Society have put a lot of their collections, digital collections, at Alabama Mosaic. Alabama Mosaic was a, is a website where they try to go out academic, academic universities, libraries, to put digital collections involved in Alabama all across the state, on Alabama Mosaic. South Alabama's done this. Yes, ma'am. Alabama's on the back there. Yeah, I know. You said it was. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a coalition of universities and libraries. Um, Springfield College has done this. The Lotus sort of uh, Society has done this. It gives a place where they can put their collections. If somebody's doing research in Alabama, they can go there and look at it. There's more than just pictures, it has documents there as well. You know, the Alabama Digital Preservation Network. That is the people who support Alabama Mosaic. They are a group that provides the way to digitize collections to put them on Alabama Mosaic. I'm not sure it's going to do a lot of good because they're mostly looking at helping organizations. Now, I said before, Mobile's records are everywhere. I gave you a list here of most of the places here in Mobile. You go more places. Local churches have records. Getting those records is not always easy. There are records in various governmental departments. Not always to get to, like the Corps of Engineers here in Mobile. They have records, but I've had people have problems trying to get to them before. Mobile Sheriff's Department has records, but that until about trying to get to those records, it's a pain in the neck. There's records everywhere. Churches, I said before, they have records. Some are in better state than others. Some are better to get to than others. The YMCA used to have records. I don't think they have them. They're everywhere. But you also have records outside Mobile. The Alabama Department of Archives and History has a lot of records built in Mobile. A lot of state agencies' records end up there. Yes, sir. Uh, I see it on the uh, I found the So I say, dealing with history of Mobile, our 
our records, unfortunately, will be found in many places, but it is a lot. But I try to give you an overview here of what's here locally in the city itself. Where you can go, I gave you a website, you can go look. Some have done some digital collections that are available here. South Alabama has done some. I mean, not, not that. The Call Social Library has done some. And again, I'm going to have a hard time remembering that. Some have not. But this gives you a way to go look, find out, you know, who they are, where they are, an idea of what they have, what hours are open. Some places are appointment only. But you can't get an appointment, you can't get in there, you can't get to their collections. That's why I put them on here. So there's records everywhere. And records show up all the time. I was telling somebody before this whole thing started, one day we're sitting in the archives and this family shows up, they found a law book, the Bleeding Lighthouse, which is off. Mobile, late 19th century. Don't have a little better battery. They had the original law book in the 1870s. Some family member died, they went on the act, they were looking through it, they found the original law book. Now we end up sending that to the National Archives, that's a federal record. And that's where it belongs. But things show up. You never know what's going to show up. Things, letters will show up. All kinds of stuff will show up. And then you have to start thinking, how does that fit in the story? That's the exciting thing about history. It's your perceptions can change because things show up. Things are buried. Things are hidden. Families hold on to stuff. That's another resource of records and mobiles. Families are holding on to their records. You know, they hold on to them. Very important to them. It's all family history, but nobody else knows about it. You might have something very important there that everybody would love to know, but they don't see it. And something happens. Well, I am over time. I need to get going and let the person's phone me come on yet. Thank you very much. I guess we'll take the right here. You want to take a break now for the next one? This guy starts off. You want to take a five minute break? Five minute break. Thank you very much.
once I get into the other you know that I was thoroughly involved in it as well, because it was just too much. Before I started, I asked him, I said, Dr. Mills, I said, is there enough there for a dissertation? <laughs> I didn't want to get three months down the road or for longer and figure out that I needed to start over with a different topic because there wasn't enough there. He said, yes. Yeah, I'm a graduate student, right? And he's a professor. You, you tend to believe them, otherwise, when it comes time for them to put their names on the document, that, that yes, you went, all, went through all this work and you finished and graduated. So I said, to this day, I am still finding records that deal with credos in, in Mobile County. Primarily because of the internet and things that are available online that I wasn't aware of. Uh, that at that time. There are many, many different types of records. Good question. There are many different types of records, and we heard about some of those uh, from Dan. Uh, there are probate records, uh, different types of probate records, different types of court records, mayor's courts, circuit court, chancery court, and, uh, and so forth. Supreme Court cases, their local government records that Ned talked about, city directories, census records, all schedules of the federal census that you can find your information on your ancestors, newspapers, tax lists, sex and reports, death certificates, Ned mentioned church records, there are also school board minutes that, that were helpful. There are mayors. At mortgage, at deeds, Creole fire company records, Creole social club records, acts of the state legislature, the American state papers that was previously mentioned, the Bureau of Land Management for federal land sales by from the federal government to individuals, and so forth. The, the point is there are many, many records. It used to be said that when tracing the lives of African Americans, that it couldn't be done. There weren't any records. But as I said, I'm still 30 years later, I'm still finding records. And there are many different types of records that are available. There are certain patterns in the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the origins of the Creole, of the Creole class here in Mobile. The FDA Offspring produced by the relationship between the French and the Spanish settlers and their white descendants and Negro, room, Negro women slave increasing. You have the white males hooking up with the black females, slave and free. I use the term black loosely because it's, 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 there are many variations in what people of color are, are referring to as, but I generally use the, the term black to include everyone. In many instances, the French and the Spanish men publicly acknowledged their mixed, family, mixed families. And there, in some cases, they didn't acknowledge publicly, but if you look at the records, you can determine who the parents of these children were. These are long-term relationships. They weren't fly by day. Uh, affairs that they, they generally lasted for many years, so they, they had concern for their families. The, the white fathers generally provided the economic means by which their uh, children of color and their families were able to carry on after, after they passed on. And there are two things that that the white settlers obtained. One, they obtained large uh, amounts of land, and with the land, they, they purchased and obtained slaves. And then the Creoles would inherit the land and the slaves from their, from their white fathers. They were Concerned with their spiritual well-being as well, we go through the Catholic Church members primarily, but also the other denominations. And you will find the baptisms, the burials, 
the narratives, the confirmations, and so forth of the creoles, the creoles of color. So who were these people, specifically? I want to mention a few, so we don't have time to go through all the families, but I would like to mention a couple of the more prominent ones. If you're probably familiar with them, if you're familiar with a little bit of history. The Chastain family, for example, there were two brothers, uh, Dr. John Chastain and Joseph Chastain, who settled in what is now North Mobile County. Dr. Dr. John acquired at least 2,900 uh, acres and he, and he obtained slaves. His brother obtained at least 640 acres and slaves, including one slave in particular whose name was Louise Hunt. On August 9, 1780, Louise Hunt paid Joseph Chastain $1,150 for herself and her four children. I think someone suggested to me that perhaps Dr. John helped pay that or not. I, I don't know if there's any specific record that shows uh, exactly where, where the money came from. But she began living openly as a concubine of Dr. John sometime within five years after she purchased her freedom. And their lives lasted for at least 20 years. And he had uh, known her long before 1785, though. And they had 10 children. And his, in his will, Dr. John made several points that are worth mentioning. He acknowledged his relationship with Louise Hall and left his estate to her and their children. His will contained an important section that provided for the protection of his family's liberty. And when I spoke two weeks ago, I wanted to find out what else did I have on Louisa to provide some other details. Where did she come from? Uh, and who may have been before the Chastain family? I, I, I don't have that much information on her, but she does appear in a couple of federal census records that pinpoint her age, uh, her date of birth, rather, uh, probably. Well, between 1730 and 1775 is the one census, and the other is 1740, 1785. She also appears in a couple of the territorial census records that shows the number of slaves that she had, for example, 13 and 1816. The 1830 census shows that she had 14 slaves in her household. Then 16, 10 years later, We know that the priest, the, the Catholic priest, baptized a number of slaves belonging to Louis Zone, at least 14 that I've had uh, from 1815 through 1843. But only one, I've only found one uh, baptismal record for the children. And then there's a May 18, uh, 1845 record that shows that uh, she had uh, recently died. And the estate, her estate papers show that, that there were 16 slaves attributed to the estate. And those were divided among her heirs. A couple of the other chastings that were uh, for their children, Basil Chastain, Basil Chastain, the son of Dr. John and Louisa, married in, in 1801 to, a, to Desiree Bartholomew, who was also known as Rosa Desiree Lawrence. Uh, two of their children were baptized. And sadly, uh, Desiree passed away at the very young age of 20 in 1806. And Basil's father died six years later. And Dr. John on the slave named Nancy. He, uh, Basil began cohabitating with, with Manson about two or three years after his father's death. But he never undertook to go to the court and claim any title to this woman. But he did obtain passage from the Alabama State Legislature for their manumission. And his inventory included two slaves that I had $450. 
And when they, they sold the slaves, they, would, they got their growing at seven hundred and eighty dollars. The basil, like other creoles of color, uh, served as, as godfather to at least three slaves. And we know this time that his own slaves were baptized. Another son of Dr. John is his brother, was Edward Johnson, who acknowledged that he had eight illegitimate children with a free woman of color by the name of Celeste Collins. The thing is, you study this long enough, you realize that everybody is connected to everybody. And if you try to figure out who this person is over here, and this person is over here, for those of you who have done some of the research, you know it's almost impossible. Okay, because they have, like the chest hands, for example, you have lights over here and you have creels over here. And some of the names are the same on both sides. Versus this. And the records don't always specify race. The deeds, for example, rarely specify race. So, unless there's another indication or, or another clue in those records where you can trace the properties you've had, you've had it before, but it's not mentioned, then it takes a little bit more detective for it. But getting down to Edward, he did declare that he, those were his children in his will, and he named his children in his will. He was buried by a Catholic priest, 1843, and he was only 42 years old when he died. The inventory of his estate shows that uh, it included a uh, Negro girl named Mary and her son Joe, appraised at six hundred dollars, plus ten thousand calves and grains at value at sixty dollars. Eugene Chastain, the son of Dr. John Chastain, left no widow with children. He left three small lots of land near Mount Vernon in, in North Mobile County. This was in, in 1860. And Zeno Chastain is probably the, the, I don't know if he was a patriarch, if that's the right word, of the, of the children of Dr. John, but Zeno probably acquired the most wealth of all the, the free people of Chastain. And he married a, a free woman of color in 1810. And one of the witnesses of Simon had to point that I didn't make earlier was that there was the interrelation between the whites and the, and the creoles of color. They served as, 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 as godparents in some of the cases. Uh, witnesses to marriages, for example. And we know that at least uh, 15 of Zeno's slaves were baptized. Mm -hmm. He served as a godparent more than 10 times, so you know he was respected in the community. One of the slaves was murdered. He really got about 410 acres from the federal government. And his estate included 30 slaves that valued over $23,000. $23,000 in 1860. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money now. There was a lot of money back then. And he appears at least 60 times in the records. Uh, it's certainly an unusual number of times compared to most people, but nevertheless. His grandchildren, uh, Dr. John Cox, found the same pattern of marriage slaves and land from their own parents. So the, the, the tradition kind of continued. continued. They were building upon that which was left to them by the white ancestry. I'm going to mention four grandchildren of Joseph Chastain. We have families of three women of color. One of them was John Susan Chastain. He had children with the three women of color named Delphine Juzan. He acknowledged his children in his will, but he did, did not mention the mother's name. He says, yes, these are my children, but he didn't acknowledge his whole life. Simon Chastain had a family with Anastasia, 
Adam. Edward Chastain had family with Claire and Grover, once again showing that somehow or another these families were unrelated. And Sidon John Chastain with Isabel Collins. The Andrew Chastain, Simon Andrew. Uh, like the Chastain before him, obtained land and slaves, developed a relationship with, with a, a slave uh, named Jane, and they had at least eight children. He did not acknowledge the paternity of his children at their baptisms, but he did so in his will. If you're looking for the will of Simon Manning, do any of you also do all the talent? The, the will book, the, the first will book in Bottle One Patent is missing several pages. The index shows the names. John Chastain, Simon Andrew, Augustine Morrison, and I think there's another one. But somebody unfortunately decided to cut out. Somewhere, somebody obtained copies of them, because I've got copies of, of those pages, but those are, uh, you, you don't know what you're going to find and where you're going to find it. I, I, found, I was given copies of some of those torn out pages by some of the descendants. Uh, the people we're talking about today. Okay, so, so Anastasia, like I mentioned, has, has a family with Simon, I mean, with uh, Simon Chastain, Joseph Chastain. And I thought that before then, they're baptized in the Catholic Church. And one of her children had a family with a white man named William the Brady. And I asked the same question as to who is Jane Andrew, but well, there's not much memory that I've been but able to unearth this time. You know, as in previous uh, cases, baptism of several of the children are, you know, have been recorded. But the baptism of Maximilian, for example, he was identified as a, as a free mulatto, but and Jane was a slave of Simon Andrew. Apparently so, but apparently it wasn't before a. It wasn't, I don't think it was recorded at, at, at that time on the local level. Because Simon Andrew uh, mandated Jane and her children for the consideration of natural love, affection, and also diverse other good causes and considerations. And he stated that she was about 50, so she was. Born about 1745, that was in 1805. And I think census letters collaborate uh, the, the year of her birth. Too. I'm sorry? Different than. I'm assuming I'm talking. Okay. You can't be a child of somebody who's born 100 years later. Uh, no, but which, okay. which one's I'm still talking. Yeah. I'll, I'll get you that. Yeah. Legislature of Mississippi Territory passed an act that manumitted Jane and his seven children, and that was in 1805. She died in uh, late 1846 and was uh, buried by one of the Catholic priests. Uh, her age in the burial record shows about 110. I think that's one of the few, if not the only burial record uh, before 1865 for. Members of the Creole in North County. I could be wrong, but I know some of the few. And as before, the slaves of Simon Andrew were, were baptized. Uh, Jane Andrew's slaves were baptized. And her estate included 13 slaves, valued by 4,400 dollars, plus cattle, plus a slave named Jack, who was about 80 years old. But the appraiser said he was of no value.
and Jane in a very similar number sold property in the city of William. Okay, so that's one thousand eight hundred and forty six, so the thirteenth day. Okay, so that's the year of our Lord, 1846, so the 13th day. 13th day of November, I have been assigned a Catholic priest at Mobile, certified that I performed a funeral ceremony in the church over the body of Jean Simon Andrew, who departed the slide yesterday at Simon's Club, Mobile County, after having received the sermons in church, and by 110 years old, the fifth year of the time of sight, Jean Simon. The second uh, large family of the Pope, actually, the Broker families. Any descendants of the brothers in? in? And uh, there were three white brothers, uh, three white Caribbean brothers who settled in Mobile. Uh, uh, Hilaire, Hugh, and Maximilian. Each of those had relationships with a, a, either a free woman of color or a slave. And as before, they had long term relationships with uh, Negro, Negro women. For example, Hilaire lived with Isabel Chastain, the daughter of Dr. John Chastain, and we saw In all but one of the baptismal records, they, uh, both of them were identified as parents. And uh, Hilaire uh, acknowledged paternity of his beloved children in, in his will, and stated that Isabel had lived with him for many years. His brother Hugh had a relationship with the slave named Amy. They had several children. He executed deeds of manumission for her and the children. And the acts of the uh, an act of the Alabama legislature confirmed the manumission. The Maximilian, their son, had uh, Maximilian uh, formed a relationship with the frozen, the frozen and brother of Simon and Jane. And he acknowledged the paternity of his children of color and served as godfather to their pillar, served as godfather to their oldest child, so that the families were connected. It's not like one played one here, even though they probably were living in close proximity, so that they were interconnected. And Maximilian gave uh, his estate to the frozen. For, to enjoy for her lifetime, and the rest of his father and his children. children. The inventory of his estate contained the Latin slaves, the price being over $3,600, as well as cattle value of $400. Now, if you have a guess, move on to a, a few things about their economic life. The cattle was an important part of the lifestyle. If you look at the estate inventories for some of the free man of color, uh, the value of livestock is very important. Well, that's just true LA, for example, had 200 head of cattle and other livestock. Basil Chastain, 60 head of cattle and other livestock. And Richard Bernini, 150 head of cattle. The third largest farm is the Asian Kitty. Oh, no, it's Zeno Chastain Sr., Maximilian de Broga, and Maximilian Collins. Contain about 3,300 acres, or about 80% of the total acreage owned by free land mine farmers. Uh, so, I thought I had it in my notes, but I went back to the 1850 agricultural schedules of the federal census. And I think it was Maximilian Collins in 1850 who had more property, more real property, more land, according to that schedule, than any other free person of color. And of some 260 names listed in that census, he had he was ranked number seven. So he basically had more land than most white people did. What else did they do to earn a living? 
Five gallons of coffee here in the city of Lorraine. She and another person had two uh, coffee stands in the public market. The Collins family tradition has it, they were, they were both, both builders, excuse me, uh, and they lived in, in a money we have in the South Mobile County. They also leased property here in the city of Mobile. Um, once again, some of the chess games. And at least in one case, they, they leased a uh, piece of property to a white man. Yeah, I mentioned Maximilian Collins, who was in South Mobile County, and his land holdings. And the, the, he grew oranges, and the press made note of the quality of his oranges. It, 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 it. They were delicious and one of the most exquisite flavor. From about 30 trees, we are told Jack realizes annually from $800 to $1,000. Imagine that just as one of the I've included a couple of tables to show you the uh, names that served by total acreage for 1850. You can see some of the names that have been mentioned. And these are people who were marked as uh, three people of color in the census. And then this is the, the next one is for 1860. And I included only the top 16 names. And once again, the, the three bad ones in particular with the total acres. Uh, and the two instances over, over 1,500 acres. So the point I'm trying to make is they had land and they had slaves. Some of the wealthier ones. Not everybody, of course. And here's some figures on the, on the uh, slave ownership. 1950 to 1860. These, are, these came from the uh, slave schedule of the federal census. So there's, you know, at any one particular time, there's uh, certainly some uh, fluctuation in the numbers. I've mentioned some of the, the numbers with the, uh, the value of slaves from their uh, inventories. Now, I mentioned a couple of, a couple of other things. Uh, the Creoles had their own fire company. First, they were the first volunteer fire department here in Mobile in 1819. Although, when I was doing the research for my dissertation, most of the newspapers that I looked at were through uh, 1865, so I didn't, I didn't really go to the young man. Had I done so, I, mean, uh, I think the newspapers uh, after that are pretty consistent that I've seen as far as the origin and the date that the Creole fire company started. And getting 1890 is a year, but there is there was an argument too that they, they weren't quite sure exactly when it began. But 1890 was the year. I looked at the Constitution and bylaws uh, of the organization. Those are the Museum of Mobile. Uh, to, to be a fireman, you have to be at least 16 years old. They required the fireman wear a uniform. That they pay strict attention to orders from officers. There were uh, uh, honorary memberships to this. One thing I haven't mentioned too that, that, that I want to stress too is the Creoles were well respected here in Mobile. Okay, they were respected by uh, the white community uh, as well as the, the, the black community. And they were proud. They were proud of their heritage. They were proud of who they were and what they did. The social event of the year was the Creole Fire Company event in April when it celebrated its anniversary of the Torchlight Parade, followed by a dance. The newspapers covered the, the uh, parade and, and were complimentary.
complementary in their regards. Creole school. Uh, the Alabama legislature in December 1833 uh, gave the mayor and Alabama the city of Mobile license to but, uh, power to license suitable persons to teach the free color Creole children from those to from those who were uh, uh, in those areas that were controlled by the French and, and at the time of the Louisiana Purchase. The city officials were supposed to approve the, the, children, the names of the children and record their names. I have never found uh, such a book containing the names of the children. We don't know too much about the Creole school. Uh, the Rome and Rome from one city director from 67, just to give you an idea. There apparently was some Creole, I, I don't know what to call it, a formal school, but there was some activity in North Mobile County because in one of the records they mentioned local trustee in one of the chastisings uh, was a local trustee of the Creole school. Another Creole uh, organization was the Creole Guard. In, in November 1862, the Alabama legislature authorized Creoles of color between 18 and 50 to enroll in militias in the defense of the city and county if, in the opinion of the mayor, it is expedient. I haven't found any records for the organization. There are several references in some of the mobile newspapers. Uh, to the Creole Guard, to, to maybe some of the meetings, but as far as their specific day-to-day -day activity, I don't know if they did. One of their other organizations was the Creole Social Club. It was organized in 1857. And they were organized to uh, preserve the Spanish feeling, promote love, charity, amusements, and the practice of morality. They were kind of an uh, organization to, to help one another and take care of one another when they needed help. Uh, the clubs were scheduled to meet the first Sunday of each month and every month at 3 p.m. and quarterly meetings on the first Sunday of January, April, July, and October. And uh, as with any organization, they were typical officers in the club, president, vice president, and so forth. The duties of each were stated in the application. For example, Article 3 dealt with the president. There were 11 sections to it describing various duties. For instance, the president shall only vote in case of time. The president could call special meetings uh, whenever necessary. They were pretty strict, too, I think. As were the, the, the firemen and some of their rules and how they treated one another. Uh, and the secretary of the Five, the, the meeting the meeting was all going to close with a prayer. The secretary to keep a regular role and record of all the proceedings of the club. Uh, keep a record uh, of the names of the board members and uh, include their birthplace when they died and the nature of the disease uh, that caused their death. Secretary had another, another duty in order to keep a list of all the delinquent members and how much they have. What, what, why were they fined? Different fines. What were they given fines for? Was that an indication about like, rule uh, breaking? I think they specified. I don't remember what they had. Uh, I think well, they were supposed to attend the funerals of fellow club members. Sure. Uh, they were supposed to donate. I think it was a dollar to help the widow of a, a fallen member. For example, uh, I know some of the firemen, for example, if their behavior was inappropriate, for example, if they were drinking, 
uh, in design. Uh, that sort of thing. That they're pretty good. Yes, sir. A fellow uh, club member needed assistance because he was ill and couldn't work. The other members were, were there to help. What you have to do to get into the club? The crew of the first club. They need a written application providing, for example, the age, occupation, place of residence, uh, and so forth. So the five dollar application fee. And then the three members were required to look into the character of the proposed new member. Three negative votes. Sorry, didn't make it. No person could become a member of the club unless he's physically and morally sound. And the age requirement uh, no, no less than 21, no more than 55. Givers, due for a dollar a month, those things are reasonable. 50 cents per month uh, after the first year. Didn't regularly attend meetings, you got fine. Didn't pay your dues, you got fine. You said if you could uh, be expelled, these are pretty much uh, the exact words of the Constitution for conduct unbecoming a gentleman or generally offensive to his brother members by a vote of the majority of the members present. And you could be expelled as well. Life membership is $25 with certain conditions. Military, there are a couple things I want to mention about the military. I'm not a military person, I haven't studied the military, uh, per se, or military events, but there were Creoles who were members of the Mississippi Territory of the Times, for example. We have a copy of a uh, muster and a payroll for Zeno Chastain, this is the one we need to travel. And then the, the Civil War. I discovered not too long ago, a year or so, uh, some records that are available on the internet to, at Fold 3. Are you familiar with Fold 3? You say Fold, F O L D. F O L D 3. They have, uh, I don't know, if the library has the. I think, the local, I think you can access it to the local library. No, you can't access it to the local library. It's a subscription-based uh, service. I don't know what, what the fee is. I know I have access to my own county library, but it's, uh, you know, it's not like it, it has records from the National Archives, military records, and other things. But I came across some records known as the Citizen File. And these original records pertain to goods furnished or services rendered to the Confederate government by private individuals or business firms. Now I thought, well, I'll take a look at it and see if there are some of the familiar names in there. For example, Zeno Chastain Jr. received $36.25 for five days hire of four team meals one of the ordinance stores in 1862. He received money for uh, pounds and pounds of talent, and uh, he had that in his team of uh, meals, I'm sorry, for road repairs. He had a chair basically somewhere that they uh, ran out their, their oxen, the meals for, for uh, hauling things. Why did they do this? I don't know why they did it. Did they do it because they wanted to make money? Possibly. Did they do it because they supported the Confederacy? Possibly. Because they had something to lose too, at least the one that had all a lot of land and the slaves. Right? This is in 
contrast to Creoles who lived upon uh, the Mississippi coast. There is a, a file from the Southern Plains Commission. Anyone familiar with the Southern Plains Commission? If you were loyal, if you were a Southerner and loyal to the uh, to the federal government, and the federal government uh, borrowed your horses, for example, or they borrowed, uh, took a couple of your cattle and, and or your hogs, and, and, or or whatever, for their for their use, then you can file a claim after the Civil War and ask the federal government to be reimbursed. They won such free person of color in Mississippi in Pasadena, filed such a claim. And there were, there were several people uh, in the community supported his claim and supported his um, statements that he was loyal to the Union and not to the Confederates, which is completely different than the Creoles in North Mobile County. I do. His last name is Boudreau. His first name is Sever, S E D E R E M, I believe it is. If you have access to the Southern Plains Commission and want to read some interesting information, find his, his, his file, find his record. It's maybe 50, 60, 70 pages. But there's some excellent family information. That's the point. One of the points that I should make is, in those files in particular, there's excellent genealogical information. And when you, when you say that Pasadena the Creoles were different, was Pedro, were they, did they have the same mindset? Were there others there that were you in? Yes, yes, yes. That's typical? Yes. From what I, just from what I heard in that one particular file, yes. But he explained to his father once, he talks about his father, and talks about his cattle, just like the little girls in your cattle, and talks about various family members, and uh, it's very uh, enlightening. As are most of the files from the Southern Plains Commission. Um, Dr. Hunter, you mentioned the, the importance of faith that the Creoles had, uh, and the, the priests sometimes go in the Visited North County and they, they baptized maybe 20, 30 uh, children uh, at, a day at, at a time. Even mentioned them in their, in their contributions to local, state, 
at national history. As I mentioned before, too often it was said that you cannot trace the lives of African, uh, the lives of African Americans or people of color. In it. It's important to tell the story to preserve all records that contribute to their understanding of their ancestors. Historians, and especially family historians, need to debunk myths about the African American experience in general, and specifically about American about family stories that have been handed down for generations. People have a need to know where they came from and how they got to where they are today. I know when I was coming to Mobile to do my research and my dissertation that in the mid, in like eight, 19, I'm sorry, it was the 1800s, in the 18, in the 1900s, in the 1980s, I was amazed when I went over across the street to the local history of genealogy department and see the number of people that were doing this sort of research. And of course, today with the internet and DNA, I'm sure the numbers have multiplied. Learning about our past helps us to appreciate the present and connects us with our ancestors. Preserving the records and the stories will ensure that future generations will have a greater understanding of the past and a greater understanding of one another for everyone. So this is kind of the sun, the creoles, land, slaves they inherited, they built upon the economic needs that their white ancestors left them, and they built upon those. They were uh, respected in the community, uh, by the white community, uh, and the black community. They were people of faith. They had their own organizations. And it's important for the descendants to keep their history alive. Thank you. Uh, 
Both kids at Atlanta, and so this was a big mystery. There's tons of newspaper articles about Randy Fuller. They had no idea who he was until someone noticed that there was a stranger that had been in town, which was William Fuller. He had got a hotel room. So the whole, all this is documented in the newspaper, so Atlanta Journal. Um, so this is research I had done over and over again. And all of a sudden, I came across an article in, in uh, one of the Atlanta journals that Render was at a home called uh, at home for the Incurables, which is in Atlanta. And it was there for ages, uh, up until probably the late 1950s. It was still in operation. Uh, and I kept reading and finding little bits of information here and there. Well, I found out that Render actually made something of himself. He never left the home, but he learned how to type by using his mouth. And there was actual pictures and images of him using a typewriter um, at the home in Kyrgyz. He wrote journals and that type of stuff, uh, religious pamphlets, and he did uh, wrote grants and stuff for the home of the so they could get extra money. So my search was on at that point. I wanted to find these journals. You know, they had to exist. They had to be there someplace. So I called around and found out A.G. Rhodes uh, Rehab took over uh, the home of the Curables, uh, in the late 50s. So I called up there and spoke with them and said, you know, explain the situation, who I was, uh, all this information, and they went and looked into their records. They had one copy of the Render's Journal. So I now have ownership of that. I drove to Atlanta, met with them, we did all things with the press. But I have Render's Journal from the uh, 1920s that he typed. It's the original, it's not a copy, it's an original. So now I'm in a problem. Yes, I want to share this with my family. I want to let everyone know it's already in deterioration. Uh, I've already put it in the archive of sleeve, that type of stuff. So, flatbed scanners are great, but until you have something large, uh, then you know, you're scanning it apart, scanning it apart, you've got to put it together. It's just... Photographer, I've been doing photography for about 30 years. So, I've heard of people using cameras to do archives of books and photos, that type of stuff. They aren't so easy to do. So, set up a camera, take a straight down a shot, the lights to the side, uh, we archive uh, his journal. It is absolutely pristine. You get that, you can zoom down and see the fighters in the paper. So now we have that into a JPEG or a PDF, and we send that PDF out to the family along with it. I wrote up the entire story. And his entire story included articles from the Atlanta Journal and basically made a book out of it. And now that his family keeps it. I'm keeping his memories alive. I'm keeping William Fuller's memories alive. Not all his great memories, he screwed up and mistake. I didn't walk in his shoes. I had a special needs daughter, so I could understand being in some place like that, not being able to work, do anything, or care for a child. Um, so I can't fault him that, but I'm keeping that memory alive. I'm keeping uh, Mary Fuller and the uh, baby that passed away in uh, childbirth. I'm keeping that memory alive. And the memory of all, from all the descendants from there. Uh, it's something important, and it's something a lot of people don't think about. These records are out there. They're in a filing cabinet. They are with a title company. They are, they're there. <laughs> It takes a lot of investigation, phone calls, it takes someone, the, uh, so thankful the lady at A.G. Rhodes, she could say, no, we really don't have anything. And, no, she actually got up and went and looked and said, hey, I found it, called me back, and made a huge story for them, gave them a lot of publicity, which is great, uh, but it takes a, those people that actually can go out and look and find those, uh, that information. We're all getting older. These documents are getting older. Don't laugh. That's not funny. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the best way to uh, 
preserve this stuff, it is to digitize it. You can make it digital. Once it's in that format, it can be reprinted, it can be uh, put into different hard drives, um, and that type of stuff. I do a lot of genealogy for my family. So this is my setup. I run two backup drives, and then I have my main drive. They don't have to be huge. Um, I've got one terabyte is my main drive, and I got two, two terabytes for my backup. One backup, I keep in a safe deposit box for the bank, offsite. So once a month, I'll take the drive, my backup drive that's backing up. I'll take that, and I'll swap it out with the uh, drive that's at the, at the bank. Now these are documents that can never be recovered. So if the drives fail, they're gone forever. I, I can't retrieve them. Anymore. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, that, the small backup drives, one terabyte, it could be your backup could be something as simple as thumb drive. These thumb drives now can hold gigabytes of information. Dump the information on them, on them get them off the site. If you have a fire, lose it all. So put it in a safe deposit box, put it someplace in storage where you get to it later on. Um, so types of digitization. Of course, you have five minute scanners, you've got cameras, you can do it at your own house if you want to. Uh, they have them set up here, which is uh, set you up. You can have your software to put on your desktop or laptop that can connect to your camera. So you can sit there and have books. And this is what we've done. Uh, we've been able to get a uh, little public library set up with. We have a person sits there at a computer, the books in front of them, they take a picture, put the page, take a picture, put the page, just keep going. And until they've done the entire book, and you know, all that book is packaged into a zip file or uh, into a folder. And right now, they've got me going through and cleaning it up, and this, uh, fixing the color changes. Uh, Changing the contrast to bring out more details. We had, did you bring one of the main, the regular books? Did, did you bring one of the, the uh, regular books? Yes, I have a ledger book. I have the ledger book? Yes, I have two of them. Okay, the ledger book that they wrote in blue ink, blue things worse than any other ink. So, what I've been able to do is pull that blue tone out of there and actually enhance that. So now we can go in and read what we couldn't read before. So, very interesting, a lot of fun, uh, tons of information. And as all these books are completed and taken care of, this will be even more information that will be digital. And eventually, one day, when someone goes in and transcribes everything, it will be searchable. Uh, it's a start. So, does it have to be transcribed or can you use like OCR? OCR works when you have good clean text, okay. but handwriting is, is tougher. Is right. much tougher. Okay. So you can try to do OCR first, and then have someone go back and tran retranscribe to make sure it's correct. But typically, it, so it all depends on the writer. Now, if it's typed, typeface, usually it does really well. Uh, we're going to head over here in a bit. Uh, we're going to eat lunch, and then we're going to sit down uh, and actually digitize some stuff. And so you guys can see the process that we go through. Uh, we won't be doing any uh, enhancing. We don't have software here. Uh, again, any documents you guys want to try your hand at, as I said, the computer, set it up, do some pictures, try it. Uh, we're going to do that also. And that's when we'll start doing some questions and Answers and help everyone out. Yes, um, is there any concern about the light from the scanner or the camera degrading the original document? It won't degrade it any more than you open it up into regular light. So now, if you had it out of sunlight, yeah, I can see the UV would be an issue. But for doing a less than a minute flash. Uh, less, doing less than a minute scan isn't going to damage it that much. But the main thing, even if you have to damage it slightly, you have to do it to be able to preserve it. Because it's not going to get any better as long as you do it. Okay. Alright? What kind of software do you use for enhancing? 
in Hanson's bookshop. Uh, there's well, there's several different ones out there you can use. Uh, the fence, uh, this is um, Gimp is one. It's free that you can use for doing it in Hanson's. Gimp? Gimp. G-I-M-P. Uh, that's a free version. Uh, it has kind of a steep learning curve, but you can go to YouTube and learn all kinds of stuff about it. She photoshops the Adobe. Yes, ma'am. And I would like to comment too. Now, all of this equipment will be available at the library, and with that is also access to the Photo Studio enhancement uh, software that they have on the equipment for your way to do So, if that's something, if you have a photograph and you want to work on the enhancement there at the library, you will have the opportunity. Oh, is it? Okay, I didn't know that was in there. Uh, photos, old photos. Uh, there's, you can actually do it yourself as far as trying to restore them. Uh, not the actual photos, don't do that. Uh, actually, do images or scans of the actual photos. Uh, Photoshop is great for uh, cleaning them up, but there's also local places here in Mobile that will do them for you. So if you can get them scanned and take care of, or you can take them down to like Calgas, um, is one of the main ones here but that still does uh, restoration. Digital restoration. I'm sorry? Just digital restoration. Correct, just digital. I've, I've seen people attempt to, uh, I've seen people attempt to do restoration on actual photographs and it never turns out well. Tracy? I think if you don't have a total answer to questions for the land, which I think you'll answer questions anyway after when we're actually doing the scanning. Uh, it's, a, it's a quarter to 12. If we want to go ahead and break and meet across the hallway, we'll do some lunch and, and mingle for a little bit and then uh, have some hands on yep, with the equipment. Good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
uh, of an image, you know, this much. All of them will capture this much. Minus twice is dark stuff. R A W. But your particular file system is called the NDF. Yes. The diagram is the raw file of the NDF. Can and I'm not sure what you're looking Even your cell phones these days, Samsung, uh, Galaxy, I know they just use raw photographs. You can actually do this with cell phones. Um, so, for our kind of purposes, we keep all the raw files. We archive those on. They will end up being archived like this. Or if it's too big, it's supposed to go to the other way out there. The web pages or people jam on that kind of stuff. Uh, we do that in part. We do that enhancement to bring the image uh, more clearly. If that's still a raw file, that's when it becomes the JPEG or whatever. That's when it becomes a JPEG. Okay. But we keep a master file raw file separate. Yes. The raw file contains all your. Raw file would be like having a scope. JPEG versions just have a page. That's what it's but um, like I said with the program, the pictures will look fuzzy, but this is a JPEG of one of, of the most recent ledger that I finished yesterday. You can see it's clear as day, even when you zoom in really close. Because a lot of times with the smaller size files, the more you zoom in, the more pixelated you get. So that's why these programs are really good, and you want to make sure you have a really good um, JPEG size. Like with this format, with this program, you can do a normal format JPEG, a forget the middle one, and then a JPEG fine, which will give you a really, really detailed picture. And that's what this is saved as, and that's why it's so clear, even though you zoom in so much. Can you zoom out? Show this. Yeah. To give you an idea of the quality you can get with this type of style. That's the original. So, so what I'll do, like an image like that, you see where the pictures are yellow, I'll make those back a closer to the white. And also, give them a contrast of so blue, I'll take them in this blue color, and I'll pull those out. It makes them darker so you get more uh, contrast. You can be able to read it to us. And is that for my kids? Yes. How old are they? Uh, it's it's what that means. Well, the information that's in there is what we do know about this particular collection. The title of the current company, the form of the title of the current, was Southern Abstract Guarantee. And we can find them as far back as they so, but we don't, uh, I don't believe that the, the um, actual books stay back that far. I think there were some things that were transcribed in the previous book, and that probably comes in somewhere in the 1890s. So, you know, they are. Can, can you tell the story about how you came? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 we're we're working. So, so, in the, the old press building, large index books, 116 of the ledger books, and 77 file cabinets, filled, four door file cabinets. And they found them abandoned in the press building. And that was in 2008. Well, title insurance had been out of business since the 70s. So they had been in that building for that long, when they're about that long. And so that gave one of them back to the probate court, and the they said, no, we got the originals, we don't need the title service. So, so Mobile Genealogical Society took them on in 2008, and they sat a whole family until last year when, they, when Mobile Genealogical Society closed their library. And when they closed their library, they were looking for somebody to take this massive 
collection and uh, historic mobile looked at it. Auburn, you know, talked about it. Um, um, the Horse Creek Library talked about it. And in the end, the doors were closing, and I said, I'll put it in my garage because I don't know where I'm going to put it. <laughs> so, Ned, who spoke first this morning, this is Archivist Ms. Laura Hyde, was kind enough to give us temporary storage for them until the end of this month. So I think they're going in my garage at the end of this month. <laughs> but I, I don't know, not either. But um, but we we do have some of it. It is something that we can get So so yeah. So that that that's where that stands. And um, our goal is to digitize the entire collection. And at which point, you know, we're not deciding what to do. All of it. at that point, we got a long way to go. Um, but you know, we, Al has been kind enough to step up and say he'll show up at the library and help us uh, through volunteer hours to get this stuff digitized. And anybody else you know, that wants to do that, please, by all means, you know. Um, uh, Sarah's been doing, she's leaving us and going to Southern Miss to work in anthropology. In, in so, uh, hopefully, I'll be back for Christmas. So, give me a So, uh, but but yeah. So, so anything you think that you have a skill set to do or something that you can offer, please, you know, please call me. Um, you know, or, or make contact with any one of our board members or whatever, and let us know what you think you know, you can offer us to talk about it. Because there's so much. Thanks a lot. 
Doral are all these other JPEGs that you find online and you save. The basic is even worse. It's like if you're just going to do like a desktop picture or something. Um, the find is really something you want to do for these because you need all that detail. And because of um, because if you're moving from a thumb drive, you want to print it out, you want to do all sorts of stuff with it maybe, you want to make sure as you're moving it, it doesn't get compressed and stretched anymore and distorted. That's why it's really good to have this. Just a bit. Now you'll notice, uh, we're standing up here as a picture of a pink. Mm. You have a little bit of the silver color on the top left. Yeah. Mm. Which that can be fixed in post in your software. And if you go down, I think there's some at the bottom right. Oh. But notice we're not getting that, getting that silvery you know, sheen to it. We're getting the image as it is. Um, yeah, we're we're going to do the same hard. thing. Uh, was that a quick yeah. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to take our image and put it in the scanner. First of all, it. And uh, then we'll compare the two and see, just as an experiment, to see what's going Who thinks Melissa got the girl in the picture? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs>